Okay, so the other black girl um, primarily follows a young black woman named Nella. She has been the only black person working at a very uh, prestigious hoity-toity publishing house in the heart of Manhattan. Um, so she's really excited when another black woman starts working next to her. She thinks, finally, I have someone to kind of kvetch with about all of these coworkers, these white coworkers who don't understand how hard it is to be the only one. Um, but of course, it doesn't go that smoothly. Um, and Nella starts to wonder Hazel's true intentions. Um, so it's a amalgamation of a lot of things. I call it a horror tinged workplace thriller. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's the other black girl in a nutshell. Can you talk a little bit about your writing process too for the book? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I started writing it while I worked in publishing. So I worked at Penguin Random House for a few years. Um, and the idea came to me while I was at work. Um, and I mean, essentially, <laughs> the story is that I was in the bathroom and another young black woman came out of the bathroom stall. Um, and in that moment, I was so surprised because I counted as many people of color do, I think. I was counting how many people work on my floor and I knew it was me and another older black man. So seeing this black woman was very perplexing. Um, and I remember being really excited and thinking like, cool, like maybe we'll have some kind of like friendship and um, opening myself up to communication is what I think I was doing. Um, but there was just nothing, <laughs> nothing from her um, on the other end. And I went back to my desk and I started writing this book at my desk. Um, and and was really channeling that that first chapter I just read, actually. Um, I wrote in that moment um, because I just had this idea of like, what if there are these two black women who are in this white space and like one of them's really weird. Um, and then from there, I just kept writing and staying up late to write and, and coming into work early. And then a few months later, I put in my notice to, to finish the book. I love, <laughs> I love that you took the leap. You know? It's so scary. <laughs> <laughs> the leap is scary, but sometimes it's necessary for the dream. Yeah. You know? And so, yeah. uh, what was that transition like for you? It was hard. It was hard. Um, I mean, the, the part of the reason I always say this, but uh, it's hard to be an editorial assistant. Publishing jobs don't pay that well, and to pay rent in New York is really hard to do on a salary uh, as an editorial assistant. But my partner happened to be moving in with me, so I was able to c cut costs with that. And then I started working at a cupcake shop in the village, which I thought would be really chill, and like it was really stressful. So I left pretty soon. You had to like. Frost. Frosting cupcakes is hard <laughs> to make them look good. Like mine always looks like poop. So uh, shortly after that, I uh, fortunately got a job teaching creative writing at a nonprofit to children. And for me, um, even though I was oftentimes like, oh, this book, like what's going to happen with it? Um, Teaching kids really brought me back to that, like, that's when I started lo loving to write, was at like five, six. So to be around kids who are that young, like figuring it out and encouraging that, like really brought me back to basics and like minus all the capitalism and <laughs> that I've been like just experiencing um, and getting burned out, frankly, from publishing. Yeah, I think uh, for me as a writer too, um, being in a room where you can share with other writers, yes. no matter what age, right? Yes. It could be young writers or any type of workshop. Um, the community, being in community with other writers is really powerful to, your, totally. like, to feed your passion in writing. Exactly. Um, and that's what a lot of the other teachers were also writers. So mm -hmm. like, it was cool to have that community too. What kinds of things would you say... Um, are really good things to keep in mind as a young writer or someone mm. who's aspiring to you know me maybe be where you're <laughs> where you are right now yeah i i would say definitely reading like reading as much as possible but also reading things that you wouldn't normally read i think it's really important to have other perspectives in mind and and understand other kinds of stories i mean i took some like pretty wild i was an english lit major in college and i took some classes that were like i took a russian lit class i took um like a poetry class even though i'm not a i'm not a poet uh, <laughs> which could be you might secretly be one <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i don't know she's hiding pretty pretty far um but taking like really opening yourself up and i also think that working in jobs that required me to talk to people. Like, I think, I mean, now that it's harder, right? But 
Um, having face-to-face -face interactions with people who are not like you, I think, makes a really big difference. And then the other thing I would say is just like spitting out that draft, no matter what. Because yeah. my first draft of this book, um, it was a different book. Like the reveals came in different places. The characters were very different in a lot of ways, and like it needed to happen that way, though. Um, it, it just needed to happen. I needed to mess it up to make it into what it turned into mm -hmm. and mess it up multiple drafts. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned something about reading. Yeah. And in the section that you read, uh, you mentioned the book Kindred, yes. which is one of my favorite yes. books. <laughs> um, I love Octavia Butler and I yeah. particularly love Kindred. It's so good. So what are some other books that are on your bookshelf for that you're reading right now? Yeah, well, I, I have to say Kindred, for me, that book's also really important to me because it's, I, I read it for the first time in high school. So I grew up in Connecticut, um, very much like my main character, Nella. If you've read the book, you will, like, if you, everything you know about her is almost kind of me. Um, and, um, but, so growing up, I grew up in a mostly white space. And my high school was mostly white teachers. My first black teacher uh, was a, a, an English teacher, and she had us read Kindred, and it blew my mind. Um, I highly recommend if people haven't read it. But um, what she does with genre and history is so good. Um, but yeah, I think other books that uh, definitely inspired this book, which isn't quite what you asked, but I'm also thinking of Passing by Nella you can Larson. Answer that question. Too, <laughs> I'm so. My, I guess my thing is like it's hard to read right now for me. Like I am, I'm finding some time, but this fall I'm getting back into it. Um, but I will say uh, Seven Days in June by Tia Williams, which is a part romance. Um, but also, it's, it's about disability, it's about blackness. I highly recommend that book. Um, it's amazing. Um, and also, All Her Little Secrets. I, I am reading <laughs> All Her Little Secrets by Wanda Morris, which comes out in November. It's a thriller. Um, a black woman finds her lover, who is a white man. They work together um, dead in the office. And it just goes from there. It's got like the firm vibes. Good mm -hmm. for Halloween. So mm -hmm. November, <laughs> All Her Little Secrets. Um, um, but yeah, Passing was a book going back. Sorry, again, you can tell I haven't yeah. been around people as much as um, I sh wish I had been. Um, <laughs> Passing by Nella Larson was a big influence on this book for me because I'd never read it before and it's set in 1920s Harlem and it's about two black women who both are able to pass as white um, and it's just about the tensions in their relationship and Nella and Hazel who is the the other black girl in this book who comes in and starts working next to Nella um, they both present as black women they're not passing per se but I kind of see passing and code switching I think there are a lot of similarities in making yourself, changing, just changing yourself to, in order to fit into a social space or a setting. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited that you said <laughs> passing. Yeah. Because I thought of passing. Really? By Nella Larson while I was reading well, the book. Well, also, yeah, her name, of course, came from, <laughs> yeah, Nella's so. name came from <laughs> Nella Larson. <laughs> um, so I, I'm curious about, you know, this uh, navigating white space and um, then, you know, getting excited. There's another black woman mm -hmm. in the space and, um, you know, thinking that something will happen where they can join forces, yeah. but that's not really what happens. Um, what can you say about working in the publishing world and navigating that kind of space and uh, what that means or how it informs the book? Yeah, well, publishing to me was a really interesting industry because a lot of it is you are supposed to bring yourself to work. Like, that is the beauty of publishing in a lot of ways is that it, it's people um, agreeing on ideas and uh, publishing books that are might change the world um, and that's huge but also a problem when the people who are making those decisions um, are all from one class and one um, one background if they're all white people who have money and and can decide you know this voice is worth listening to over this voice and so so that was something that I thought about a lot um, 
while working in publishing and how complicated that is for a young person, just first of all, a young person who is again, not making that much money and also has to kind of fit themselves into um, what their bosses say because a lot of being an editorial assistant is kind of agreeing. Um, it depends where you are, it's not every place, but it is a, a big thing, um, especially if you are, you know, have been trying to get into publishing for years, which is what I had been doing. I'd been applying for internships and, and jobs and I didn't hear anything back for so long. Um, and when you finally get into that space, you just feel like you should be so lucky. Um, and as a young black person um, who doesn't see anybody else who looks like you in that space, you feel even luckier and even more responsible to a, like, keep your cool and not come off as the angry black woman ever, but also hopefully try to bring other people of color or black people into that space. And that's all on top of, like, just being human and then, like, the news. Um, and it's just a lot. It's a lot to balance and how much you filter in and how much you, how much of yourself you keep and how much you do give to your coworkers is something that I know I've, I've navigated for years and I'm still figuring that out um, as an author now. Yeah. Um, Nella, uh, we talked about this earlier, is like goes through this struggle of like the voice and yeah. how do you keep your voice and how do you protect your voice? Can you speak a little bit about um, what the book maybe has done for you and your voice? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so a lot of my voice is in, in this book. Um, my own kind of insecurities. I mean, very much like Nella, as I said before, I grew up in Connecticut, mostly white spaces. And so um, figuring out what my blackness meant to me, not to other black people, not to other white people, was something that was a journey for me. Um, and Nella and I were in very similar places when I was working in publishing, where she's she grew up in these spaces, but then she's had her own kind of renaissance um, in terms of like figuring out who she is. And I know for me that was a really big thing that happened to me in 2015 when I first moved to Brooklyn. Um, just like seeing the news, turning around everywhere and seeing protests and really truly like grasping um, what it meant to be a young black woman in these spaces and knowing that no matter how much, no matter how white I talk, <laughs> I use air quotes, um, but because that's something that I was told, um, but no matter how I speak, dress, like some people still just at the end of the day see like a black chick and like they will come to this situation with their own ideas and I can't do anything about that um, necessarily depending on the situation and so all of those are things that like I was writing about in my MFA program at the new school because I did nonfiction and they found their way into Nella um, really grappling with those anxieties of the past but then also she has she is now finally fostering a black community in the city and then Hazel she thinks will be an extension of that but done 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 yeah <laughs> yeah well, she hopes. <laughs> she hopes, yeah. 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 And that's the thing, like, I feel like, um, and we talked about this earlier too, but like, I do feel like we're coming up against oftentimes these two ideas of like, we, we, we're supposed to be helping each other and uplifting each other and, and pushing each other up. And that's really important. But also, there is this scarcity complex and this idea that there can really only be one of us. And that often causes competition, animosity. Um, and that comes from, again, the fact that we are oftentimes a quota. Yeah. There is one thing that they do connect on. Yes. <laughs> That's yes. hair. I like this transition. <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk a little bit about hair and, you know, because it's it's such a a, a, a powerful image, I yeah. think, for myself in yeah. the book. <laughs> and I can totally relate to all the hair scenarios. Yes. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yes. Hair is a big part of the book. And as you can see, a really big part of the cover. Um, and I just... For me, I've had a really complicated relationship with my hair. Um, I was relaxing it for a very long time because I wanted to like blend in with all of my white friends, um, even though of course that would be <laughs> that was not possible. Um, but I have this, you know, doing the straight hair thing for a while, and then and that epiphany kind of that I mentioned earlier, moving to Brooklyn and like having that um, experience. I 
chopped it all off at a Dominican barber shop um, and it felt great. Like I felt so good. I just seen this Black, Black Panther documentary, saw Kathleen Cleaver talking about it. Like I was feeling very empowered and connected to the Black diaspora in a way that I'd never had felt before um, for various reasons. And so I knew for Nella, who also coincidentally experienced the same thing, um, I knew that would be a big part of her draw to Hazel because Hazel has um, locks and like is so cool and from Harlem and even though a lot of things about Hazel are kind of like intimidating to Nella in terms of like her being worried about being black enough she still knows they both have natural hair and they both in a sense are coming from a similar experience in that like we all know I think we all know, I feel like that's a generalization, but black women, like, there's so much tied to our hair and there's so much political, just there's so many politics tied to our hair and we also spend so much time mm -hmm. thinking about our hair. And I know my earliest memories as a kid are like my mom with her hands in my hair and like braiding it, to, it was so painful. But like that was our bonding experiences and I know she did that with her mom and so there's just a lot wrapped up in it and I knew that would be the thing that pulled them together in the beginning. Yeah, and I love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, this book deals with um, issues of race, you know, is this about race? Um, is something that's mentioned in the book? Um, having to work twice as hard, something that's mentioned yeah. in the book. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering, uh, and there's so many conversations that I think people can have yeah. um, from what's happening in the book. What are some conversations that you hope people will have uh, based off of, you know? Yeah, I mean, the response I get, you were saying you, you were like talking to Nella. <laughs> the response I get about the end of the book is always the str the, such strong responses. Um, and people ask me why I did it. I'm not gonna spoil it, but um, I did that and I had that ending for a reason um, because I really want people to talk about just what Nella's been going through in this book. Um, why she feels the way she does, why she can't speak up to a problematic white author. There's a scene where uh, the author who keeps the lights on at Wagner Books writes a really problematic black character named Chartricia, um, and she kind of has to explain to him why it's problematic. And it's such an, a cringy conversation, um, and there aren't, it's just complicated. Like, I don't think there are any right answers to like how to handle certain conversations like that, where it's like, should she have spoken up? Should she not have spoken up? Um, is that, should that be on her to be the person to tell him that this is a problem? So all of those are things that I know I talk about with my friends all the time. Um, and also just like the conversations about like, you know, your black card getting revoked. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> those are all things too. I mean, the line between selling out and code switching, um, especially with just like, there's just so many, so many things to talk about in that regard too, I think, uh, especially around black, black people and black artists and what our responsibility is to ourselves, to our communities and to outsiders, people who are not black. And so all of those things I'm hoping people will talk about. Um, the thing that's been really cool from readers is, uh, especially white readers, is the references. Um, I've had a lot of people tell me they looked up like 4C hair and okay. I was like, oh, that's awesome. That's research. <laughs> <laughs> like things that I know that I talk about all the time and like, like Steve Urkel references, like all of those things like, um, I really wanted to have those elements too, to really kind of invite readers who might not necessarily have these conversations into our world, but also like, we don't have to do anything. Like you can just Google it and look it up. And I've, I've heard from a lot of white readers that it was so easy and they also had no idea, um, which is kind of surprising to me, but it's also not. Um, so that's been really interesting too. And I wanna add that there is a discussion guide on my website and Simon & Schuster's website with all kinds of questions about the book. Uh, if there are book clubs and because I do think if I can say this I do think there is a lot to talk about for yeah, book clubs there's <laughs> plenty to talk about and I think uh, this copy might also have questions in the back Oh, oh, cool. Or my copy has questions in the back. Oh, I don't know. Is it a Barnes & Noble copy? It is a Barnes & Noble Oh, okay. Copy. This is a slightly different uh, question list. 
Okay. But it's still it's still good still questions. Question. <laughs> still good questions. Yes. So get that um, get that edition. Yeah. <laughs>